And this does not mean that you accept everything passively and create a fantasy. No. Your perception supports how you interact with the world. To see the world as art is a tool of the mind, and it's a tool that Guido uses to survive, to transform other people's lives, to save his son. Hi, I'm Gabriel from GabrielSeanWallace.com, and this is Identity Coaching with Movies, the podcast where we use movies as coaching tools. I'm an identity coach, which means that I help you to rediscover, reconnect, and recreate your identity from the inside out. And in this podcast, we use movies as the magnificent tools they are for identity coaching. In this episode, we're using the movie Life is Beautiful to look at life as art. This is episode three of Identity Coaching with Movies, the podcast where we use movies as tools for personal development and identity work. And I'm thrilled to continue with this masterpiece, Life is Beautiful. Life is Beautiful. (laughs) Winner of three Oscars in 1997, including... The Best Foreign Language Film, written by Roberto Benigni and directed by Roberto Benigni and starring Roberto Benigni. (laughs) And he also won the Best Actor Oscar for this. And did you know that he is the only actor to ever win it for a non-English language role? Unbelievable. The, the only one to ever win the best actor. There have been best supporting actors, uh, best actresses. He's the only one to win it for this one. Still. So keep listening to the whole podcast to learn how a 19th century philosopher helped write this 1997 script the answer to Dr. Lessing's final riddle, and how a tank symbolized Joshua's growth into manhood. Now, if you would like the identity worksheet that supplements this movie and this podcast, please go to my website at gabrielseanwallace.com, and there will be a pop-up that will ask you if you want access to all my identity worksheets from every episode of this podcast. I promise you that that little pop-up is not meant to be annoying. (laughs) I know they can be, but it really is just to make it very clear for you that this is where you get the worksheets, okay? So enter your email there. You get free instant access to it. I'll send the worksheets in a zip file to you directly to your email. And also, I'll send you all future worksheets directly to your email. Okay, so that's gabrielseanwallace.com, spelled G-A-B-R-I-E-L-S-E-A-N, W-A-L-L-A-C-E dot com. All right, so this film has so much to explore. And if you have not seen this film, first of all, why not? (laughs) I highly encourage you to pause this film right now and go watch the movie because there will be spoilers in this podcast and furthermore as i said last time with with the groundhog day podcast you will gain so much more 
from this podcast by having watched the film already. So I will assume throughout the rest of this podcast that you've watched the whole movie, okay? So what is this movie about? I'll just remind you in case it's been a while since you've seen it. It's an Italian movie set right around, is just before World War II it begins. And it's about Guido, played by Benini, Roberto Benini. He is an Italian who is moving from the countryside to the city with his friend. And he meets a school teacher who he falls in love with. He woos her off her feet. And they get married and have a son. And then things take a turn when World War II comes around and he and his son get sent to a concentration camp because he is Jewish. So I'll leave it there for now. And in this podcast, we don't go scene by scene. We go theme by theme. And before we start these themes, uh, I just want to remind you that wherever you're listening to this, I would really appreciate it if you did subscribe and leave a positive review because it really does help. So the themes are... There are only two themes this time, so we should be able to get through it in one podcast. All right, so the two themes are life as art and life as a game of riddles. Now, I could have I could have broken the movie into many other themes, but what swayed me in the end was that this movie really is a movie of two halves if you look at the content of it. And so I wanted to reflect that in my podcast about this movie. And remember that we are really using this movie as a launching pad for identity coaching, okay? If you if you don't know yet, uh, I am an identity coach and all of this is geared toward your your personal development as a human being, okay? I'm aiming to help you, by looking at this movie, help you to transcend the current limitations that you've put upon yourself and transform, help you to transform yourself, transform your own identity from the inside out, okay? And movies can be a great tool for that. So let's look at this starting from life is art right from the opening scene if i were to ask you first of all what the opening scene was in this movie i wonder whether you would be able to tell me even if you just watched the film just before this podcast you might still get it wrong because It is not how most people remember it with Roberto Benigni Guido. I should call him the character's name from now on. (laughs) So it is not Guido in the car as the car has lost its brakes. That's the second scene. The first, you might not even really consider it a scene, but it's a little clip. It is a foreshadowing. We... We have a visual foreshadowing of the most horrific vision in the movie. And that's from later on. But over top of the vision is a narration. And the narration says that this is a story that's not easy to tell. It is like a fable. A fable of sorrow and wonder and happiness. And so, by saying this, there's an immediate connection. Without you really consciously knowing it, there's an immediate connection made, a parallel 
between real life and art. Now, I spoke a little bit about the nature of art as a personal development tool in the first podcast we did on Groundhog Day. And it is that. And you might even say it is so much more. You might even say that life is art. And we can certainly we can certainly perceive life as art and ourselves as the artist, the creator of our life. And you can also consider yourself to be the work of art. You can consider yourself to be both at once the art and the artist. And that perception of life can be very empowering. So there is this connection made right from the get-go. And then we go from this really somber, horrific-looking scene, or at least a dark scene, to this cheerful, bright scene in the car with Guido's friend in the driver's seat reciting Italian poetry. And the poem that the friend is reciting, I can't rem- remember the uh, the friend's name right now, forgive me, <laughs> but he's reciting a poem which is prophetic in the scope of the movie, in the world of the movie. And it's very telling. He speaks of a man achieving bliss. You you might not even be paying attention to the poetry at this point. You may just be taking in the surroundings of the movie, having a look at, at Guido, trying to get a feel for the movie. You might not even realize what he's saying. I I certainly didn't the first time I watched this movie. Probably not the first three times I watched this movie. So, he's actually speaking of a man achieving bliss and not being able to resist something. And both of these ideas, or both of these concepts, Schopenhauer writes about in his book, the world as will and representation. And we'll get into that soon. And he even says when he's reciting the poetry, the trains are gone, right? How prophetic is this? Or it's foreshadowing, right? The train later on in the movie. And it literally flows from the poem to the present reality when he says, the breaks are gone, right? Within the poem, he says, the breaks are gone. And the moment later, the breaks are gone. The artist creates reality, right? He is reciting a poem, which is a work of art. And the art, the poem as the art is being morphed into their present reality as it is being created. So this is already forming the theme that life is art. So they head off track, right? This is the first comedic scene. So the brakes are not working and they head off track straight into the woods, which is a classic symbol of the unconscious. The hero's journey, the unknown world in the hero's journey. And I'm sure I'll do a podcast later on about the hero's journey because it's something that's essential for you to understand uh, with your identity work. But they're heading into the unconscious or the, at least into the unknown world. And they get through the woods, right? Even though they say, oh, we're going to die, they get through the woods. And what happens 
is that Guido becomes a king in the eyes of the people, right? It's all very, it's all masked in this hilarity that's ensuing, right? <laughs> but, but Guido is becoming a king in the eyes of the people. He's a hero. He becomes a hero after he has gone through the woods, through the unconscious. It's absolutely hilarious, and it displays Benini's comic genius right away. But don't let that fool you from the underlying symbolism there. And when life suddenly becomes out of control, it wakes you up. Because he was sleeping, right? He was sleeping before then. And then the brakes were gone. Life, he wasn't, he wasn't driving. He wasn't controlling where he was going in life. He was very passive, right? He was asleep. But when it's ready, it wakes you up. It takes you down into the woods. And when you've gotten through the woods, through the darkness and the chaos, you now have the responsibility to save others from that same out-of-control threatening force. And so Guido is able to do this, becoming a hero as a result. Not just a hero, but in the eyes of the throngs of people, actually a king, right? So he's he has gone through a miniature hero's journey there. So after that happens, he we see him fixing their car on some rustic farmland, right? And he he meets a a girl, like an adolescent girl, I suppose she is. And he kind of creates an exotic fantasy for the girl that he meets, saying that, that he's a prince, right? Again, royalty. <laughs> and he and he tells her that he'll replace the castle with with camels and hippos. And she sort of buys it. Or at least can she convincingly plays along, right? And then the princess drops from the sky, right? Very all very mythical, but it works. And it works because Guido is essentially the the one creating this whole the perception of it, right? It could have been just a woman falling from the the window in the in the barn there, and he would catch her and he ask he could ask her if she was all right, blah blah blah, right? But he transforms it into something royal. He transforms it into something which is transcendent from the everyday common life and it is his ability to to transform these things that makes him so royal on the inside right it makes him an artist and it makes his life art so she gives him the eggs which is in case you didn't realize, <laughs> highly symbolic that she reciprocates his obvious sexual interest in her. Okay? And we're reminded of the eggs later on again as well. But we'll get we'll get back to that. It's when he's denied the loan, right? They come back. But um he he continues to create his own reality, right? He sees his uncle's horse and he calls the horse Robin Hood. Again, he is inserting these mythical or legendary figures into the world, into his environment, which he is surrounded him, which is his surroundings, right? So he is now... He's enveloped himself in a mythical world because that's how he sees the world. 
but he's he doesn't see the world because that he doesn't see the world as that because it's coming at him he sees the world like that because he is the one projecting that magical i guess you would say um, the the just the magic onto his world around him he's the one creating it so he is the artist and so we're reminded of the eggs right when he's denied the loan and he incites uh her fiance's anger and what happens then is he gets on a bike again and again he is out of control he steers it right into her again on an out of control vehicle this time a bike but again so we're beginning to see a little bit of repetition there and so you should be able to see that it's a theme especially as we keep going forward so he collides right into the princess <laughs> oh i'm gonna call her the princess and it's almost as if there is an there's a force which he's not in control of that is driving these two people together and that is often what love can feel like right so when we see him later on if you remember on the bike carrying his family her and his son he's still a little bit he's going really quickly but he's in control he's going very fast but he's in control ultimately at that point now it's significant all these vehicles are significant we see him later on in the car right he's he doesn't know how to drive in the rain right and then of course i won't even have to remind you about the train or even the car before the train that he's forced into these vehicles are a theme and it shows that guido cannot control where he is going he is led by fate there is something that is leading him in his life right but and it's a big but <laughs> he alters the experience of it with his genius and that word genius i'm using very intentionally and we'll get back to it but i want to ask you this and this is the first question on the worksheet hope i hope you've downloaded it it's the first question is there anything in your life that feels like it's driven by fate or a higher intelligence is there anything in your life that feels like it's driven by fate or a higher intelligence now remember you can control even if you cannot control what you feel is being driven by fate you can still control how you perceive that how you respond and how you perceive so he's learning how to be a waiter after this and his uncle tells him something very significant and this is a quote you're serving you're not a servant serving is a supreme art god is the first servant god serves men but is not a servant of men now again the artist in this case is guido right serving is a supreme art the artist in this case is guido and his art is serving others in life okay this scene directly shows us that guido 
is approaching life as if it were a work of art. And his art is to serve others. This is it. This scene, sh it shows you. This line shows you what it is. And that this art is divine. It's a divine art. It's a sacred privilege. It's a sanctimonious art. It, 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 it is something that needs to be treated with devotion, right? Living a life as if it were art. And, ser and that art is service. And how does Guido serve? He serves with humor and joy and love. And we'll see this. Now, his friend is, they're in bed together, right? <laughs> Not that kind of in bed together, but they're in bed sleeping, going to sleep in, in the same bed. And his friend misinterprets Schopenhauer, really. Now, Roberto Benigni in real life does not misinterpret Schopenhauer. And we'll see why. But the friend in the movie misinterprets Schopenhauer when he says, it's, I am what I want to be. Now, Guido is curious because Guido sees the world in a magical way, remember? We know that he he already is is projecting all of these magical m mystical legends into his world, and really, you know, this is essential in any personal development work or any growth that you wish to have as a human being, because what is magic other than something beyond our limited perspective of reality? Hmm? I believe it was uh, Arthur C. Clarke who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I would go further and say not only technology, but reality. Many things in life are really indistinguishable from magic. Where do you draw the line? The choice is yours. Where you draw the line between reality and magic, that's up to you. You can see reality as magic. You can merge the two. And in so doing, you are enlivening your own perspective of reality, your frame of reality, the colors of the palette of your own reality. You are, you're adding, what, what are those things called? Those little sparkly, like glitter. <laughs> it's like you're adding glitter to blowing a, a whole dust, dust cloud of, of, glitter onto your frame of reality if you embrace that life can be magical because this is exactly what guido does and not for nothing because when he does it he is more capable of doing many other things he becomes a more skilled person practically he's able to achieve more because he is allowing, not just allowing, embracing the perspective of reality as magic. Okay, so then he, he sees his princess for the third time. And he's continuously generating the magic, right? He pops, he pops out from, from behind his friend's back. And she says, I, how do you do this? She giggles. Uh, he's like a magician. It's almost as if his curiosity has generated his sense of magic in the world. 
You know, later on, we will look a little bit at Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning. And he has this interesting quote, I'm going to paraphrase, that says something like, when he went into one of the camps, it may have been Auschwitz, when he went into it, he was struck by a cold curiosity. And the curiosity was simply the question, would I come out or die? And he didn't have fear in that moment. He didn't have any emotion that struck him as really negative. It was cold curiosity about whether he would live or die, which is... Mm, some people might say that's bone chilling, right? But obviously it wasn't to him. And he also writes in that book, Man's Search for Meaning, amazing book, at how surprised he was at how much a person could endure, right? So this, this theme of curiosity continues through that book. And so I would like to ask you now, and this is on your worksheet, what seems like magic to you that you could be curious about? Because if you can make that clear in your mind and form a clear sense of what you are curious about, you will perpetually grow in magic and curiosity. They feed off of each other. So now I'd like to introduce Schopenhauer into the conversation, and in particular his book World as Will and Representation. Because I think understanding Schopenhauer will give the film so much more of a rich context as we explore this theme deeper, right? Schopenhauer has already been introduced into the movie as really, he becomes a motif, right? Even though it's not, he's kind of misunderstood in the content of the movie, that's for comedic effect, mostly, I think. But it's very clear that Schopenhauer's philosophy is ingrained deeply in the philosophy of this movie. So, representation. When we say the world as representation, representation is sometimes translated as idea. We'll talk a little bit about the world as representation before the world as will, because that's how it is in the book. First, Schopenhauer talks about seeing the world as representation. So the basic idea is that it's the way in which you represent this world to yourself that is reality. Schopenhauer talks about how we do not see the real thing, but instead our own idea of a thing. And it's true. We live in a completely sensory world, right? I mean, nothing that you experience lives outside of your human senses. Nothing that you experience as your ego exists outside the, this sensory world, right? Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Now, you could argue, perhaps, that, you, that it is possible to go beyond that. And I agree. I have been to experiences beyond that. But what we're talking about here is on an everyday level, what you experience lives in the senses. And so what does that tell you? Well, essentially, you 
not only can you manipulate this idea you have of the world, but you do manipulate it anyway, whether you like it or not. You're manipulating your idea of the world. You know, one of his quotes, one of Schopenhauer's quotes uh, is, every person takes the limits of their own field of vision for the limits of the world. Let that sink in for a minute. Every person takes the limits of their own field of vision for the limits of the world. And that's absolutely true. You know, there's so much that you don't know, so much that I don't know, that we we don't even know we don't know, because they're beyond the limits that we've experienced on a basic sensory level. And because there's something we haven't experienced, we tend to completely exclude that from possibility. Well, because we don't even know it's there, right? So the world as we know it is a representation created by our minds. The world as representation is how everyone experiences the world. We cannot know the world in itself unless we enter a state of deep contemplation or meditation, according to Schopenhauer. So everything is always a subjective perspective. And Guido in the movie seems to be a character who has taken this concept and has run with it. And he chooses to dwell in his faith, to dwell in his humor, in the beauty of life. And not only this, but he seeks to help everyone else to experience the world in the same beautiful way. He understands that his son's reality is made of his own perception, and so he gives him the gift of experiencing a concentration camp as an elaborate game with a fantastic prize. Earlier in the movie, he influences, influences his wife to see the world in a magical, mystical way full of the, the Virgin Mary dropping, <laughs> dropping things from the sky, right? And I think Benini was showing us the possibilities of playing with the idea we have of the world, of reality, right? Roberto Benini, uh, before this movie came out even, he was a very renowned comedian in Italy. People called him the funniest man in Italy. And you don't become the funniest man in Italy by being someone who perceives the world in the same way as everyone else. I think I heard him in an interview at one point say that the world is sad and beautiful. And, well, this film is certainly both of those things. You know, what if you saw everything in life as beautiful? Some people do. And some of those people consciously chose to cultivate that perception. Schopenhauer also said, everything is beautiful only so long as it does not concern us. Now, in this quote, I think he, he reveals, <laughs> he exposes <laughs> his own perception. That is, that when tragedy comes to us, when tragedy arrives, 
when misfortune and suffering arrives at our doorstep, that it is beyond most people's capacity to perceive the world as beautiful anymore, to perceive that event as beautiful. And I believe that Benini chose the most horrific situation he could to show us that no matter what the situation, we always, always have a choice of how we represent the world to ourselves. Now, before you say, well, that's a denial of reality, ask yourself this. How do you know that it's a denial of reality? If your perception is that not all life is beautiful, or even that all life is a struggle, or all life is suffering, or all life is difficult, or that some of it is and some of it isn't, isn't that just the way you are choosing to perceive reality? Right? Maybe you're denying the beauty. Well, you might say, well, you can't deny the facts. Okay, nobody's arguing with the facts. But your representation of the world is about how you choose to interpret the facts, my friend, right? <laughs> what do the facts mean? <laughs> That's where the real perception is. Not just what are the facts, and some facts are good and some facts are bad. Uh-uh-uh, not so fast. See, that's a jump that people take for granted. Good and bad and ugly and beautiful, these are judgments about the facts. There's a big difference. And who is the judge of your reality, my friend? You are. You're the judge and the jury and everything, everyone in the court, right? Now, to me, I love paintings by Salvador Dali, but you might hate them. Or if you love Dali, someone else will hate those paintings. <laughs> That's all subjective. You know, to some people, the atom bomb was beautiful. The other quote that Schopenhauer said that I would like to mention is, It is difficult to find happiness within oneself, but it is impossible to find it anywhere else. Schopenhauer knew this, Roberto Benigni knew this, and Guido certainly knew this. The beauty is created within. The happiness is created within. The joy, the love, it's all, it's all created from within. And this does not mean that you accept everything passively and create a fantasy. No, your perception supports how you interact with the world. To see the world as art is a tool of the mind, and it's a tool that Guido uses to survive, to transform other people's lives, to save his son. Okay, it's not something, it's not about living in a bubble. It's about cr creating something in your mind that you can use to live in a way that helps to transform both who you are and the world in which you live. So the question I have for you here is, well, it's not really a question. It's more of a task this time. Okay, so the task is choose something that you find 
irritating or ugly and contemplate how beautiful it is for 10 minutes. Okay? I want you to contemplate that beauty that is there somewhere for 10 minutes. Why are you doing this? Well, you'll see, you'll see. Okay? Just it'll just take you 10 minutes. So either right now or after this podcast, I promise you, if you make time to do this, it can transform your understanding of your own perception. It will show you, it will you will demonstrate to yourself that you create your own perceptions of reality. You can transform how you perce- how you perceive reality not by changing the facts but by reinterpreting the facts, by rejudging the facts. And this is Guido's sacred skill. It is his gift. His gift is to be able to transform the world in which he lives in his mind into something beautiful and joyous and delightful. And he uses this to save lives. So it's not, it's not a flimsy thing. It's not something to, to cast away just because, it's, because you, you think it's not true or whatever. Okay, so that is the world as representation, but what about the world as will? So where does the will fit into all of this? Well, our body and will are really the same thing presented to us in two different ways, according to Schopenhauer. Okay, will, remember, we're talking about a book that was made, (laughs) it was written centuries ago, and he has different definitions than we do now. So... He defines will as that which is the being in itself of everything in the world and is the sole kernel of every phenomenon. The will to life, he says, drives us to survival, to nourishment, and to propagation of the human species. This is the ultimate purpose of the craving of sex. So he says, quote, everything presses and strives toward existence, end quote. Now, this means that everything that we are, we have our sex drive in order to propagate the human species, to survive as a human species. And his argument is that we wouldn't choose the partners we do if it weren't for the will to life. But because we have it, we are led to choose partners who would create balanced children with us. And Guido is certainly driven by this. There's lots of evidence of his sexual drive. (laughs) Yet we never see Guido, we never see in Guido what Schopenhauer describes as the mystery of having actually satiated the desire and succumbing to boredom, anxiety, and eventually creating new desires for ourselves in order to escape this misery. (laughs) Schopenhauer describes, I really find this interesting, his direct quote is, directly after copulation, the devil's laughter is heard. (laughs) And so his argument is that it's ultimately a miserable saying once you've satiated the desire you you feel terrible now maybe that's a personal thing <laughs> but the way it's interesting the way sh- this will is presented in the movie especially by guido's friend right it's obvious that guido's friend doesn't really understand this will to life or is kind of blended the representation and will together and misinterpreted everything. (laughs) But what's interesting is that this 
one that's presented by the friend is more like more like Nietzsche's will to power, because N Friedrich Nietzsche came up with something that he called will to power and said, "No, no, no, uh, we don't have a will to life. We have a will to power. Everything is driven by our." desire for power. Now, I would say Guido is imbued himself with a sort of will to imagine. This is his ultimate um, gravitational will, right? Is he is he feels compelled to to portray the world as magical, right? And imagine the world as he, as, as it is fit for his curiosity. So I would say, you know, his, he has a will to imagine, but that's just what I think. Now, Schopenhauer said that there were two ways of transcending the suffering life, which is caused by the will to life. Because remember, he doesn't think the will to life is a very uh, satisfying thing. Because once you have, once you've had sex, the devil's laughter is heard, and ultimately you're kind of forced to uh, propagate the human species with someone who may not be right for you, but is instead right for the universe, right? So he he doesn't have a very optimistic view of this will to life. So he says that there are two ways of transcending this suffering. And one of them is to basically become a monk, a sage, and meditate, become an aesthetic, and meditate your your way beyond this this cycle. Now Guido certainly doesn't do that. <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't delve into chastity. But the second way is to is through the power of art, through the appreciation of art and philosophy. And this is a secondary way of achieving transcendence. According to Schopenhauer, one can escape the cycle of desire and misery through contemplation of beauty and art. For this will lift us out of real existence and become disinterested spectators. That's a quote. This will lift us out of real existence and become, and we will become disinterested spectators. Now, in Life is Beautiful, and take note of the name of that movie there, Life is Beautiful. Perhaps Guido is one who has escaped this cycle by plunging himself into a state of everlasting appreciation of all life as beauty. So Roberto Benini is showing us it's a big, you know, what if this man were possible? And something that Schopenhauer says at one point in the book is how blessed must be the life of a man whose will is silenced not for a few moments as in the enjoyment of the beautiful but forever indeed completely extinguished now this is interesting because silence is a theme in life is beautiful it's a recurring motif right the uncle is at one point at the beginning says silence is the most powerful cry when he's talking about why he didn't shout for help when the bandits were coming, the barbarians as he calls them. <laughs> Guido also tells his son or warns his son that he has to be silent when having dinner. The answer to one of Doc Dr. Lessing's riddles is silence. And we'll get to that. So the intellect is cultivated, according to Schopenhauer, in order to satiate 
the fundament, fundamental desires of the will. And he says, this is another direct quote, the genius is one whose intellect is so powerful that it can escape its slavery and seek knowledge divorced from the will's desires and needs. Now, Guido is specifically called genius by Dr. Lessing. You remember that? Genius. This word is not an accident. This word is specifically used to, to point to Schopenhauer's definition. In one scene, we're saying, we're listening to something about Schopenhauer. And then in another scene, genius, okay, it's pointing to itself. So this is, this is Guido. Guido is one whose intellect is so powerful that it can escape its slavery and seek knowledge divorced from the will's desires and needs. Now Guido is in slavery in the second half of the movie. And I would argue that the intellect is able to escape. Aesthetic pleasure results from, a, from being a spectator of the world totally as representation rather than of the will. Art can temporarily provide relief of the will and allow us to enter into this state. A genius is required to create this art. Guido is such a genius. Guido creates the art of the canvas of life. His art is humor and joy and service. And those who embrace his artistic genius are changed by it. His wife, his son, his friends. His wife is changed by it, right? He is infectious. She was once somewhat of a spoiled girl. But years later, she has become someone willing to sacrifice her own safety, stepping onto a train on its way to Auschwitz in order to just be close to her husband and child. Now, one more very telling quote from Schopenhauer in his book, World is Will and Representation, is treat a work of art like a prince. Let it speak to you first. Treat a work of art like a prince. Guido's the prince, right? <laughs> prince and princess. So there are references everywhere. Here's the thing. Guido doesn't just admire the world and lay back and say, oh, everything is beautiful. No, he actively contributes to the world as art by becoming the artist. It isn't for nothing. I repeat, he saves lives. He saves his son. And even more than that, he is able to mature his son. And we'll get to that soon. Music says Schopenhauer, is the most direct expression of the will. It is the at the opera in the movie when Guido again invokes Schopenhauer, right? Guido opens a bookstore. Books are gates into other perceptions of reality. Books are art. Fiction is not just a means of escape. It is a means of transforming reality. The reality around you, even after you have put down the book. Once you've put down the book, your reality is changed. Otherwise, why would you read it? <laughs> right? You don't just read it for an escape for a few minutes. You carry that experience with you into the world after you've stopped reading, right? So Guido opens a bookshop, 
again, it shows how much of an artist Guido is in life. Service. Now, when Guido and Dora meet under the table, as I read in one essay, I believe it was online, it said they are literally right under the noses of these uh, aristocrats, right? But those aristocrats are so, so blinded in their own lives that they cannot imagine anything as fantastical as two lovers meeting under a table. That was, uh, I'd like to, I, f I wish I could give credit to the person who said that. I don't think uh, I found their name. Now, you don't need all the razzle-dazzle chutzpah of the aristocrats in order to create a stunning reality, right? They did it themselves. Again, every person takes the limits of their own field of vision for the limits of the world. Now, these people having dinner, they couldn't even imagine such a thing. And then Guido sweeps her off her feet, <laughs> quite literally, in fairy tale fashion to take her away as if it were a fantasy. On a green horse, no less. <laughs> you know, he transforms the meaning of that green horse. It was something nasty, something, something very negative, and he transformed it into something magical. He paints the picture of his own reality, and he does so for his son, too. And yes, he does change the facts here, right? We were talking about how you can change, you don't have to change the facts, you just change the judgments about the facts. And you might argue, well, okay, but Gabriel... In the second half of the movie, he actually lies to his son. He changes the facts, right? Yes, he does. And we'll get into that soon. But Guido's unwavering commitment to his son, as I read in, I think it was, it may have been the same essay online, this commitment is inspiring to the other men. No one stands up against him. And he turns those incommodious bunkers, to say the least, <laughs> into part of the game, right? He turns everything into part of the game. The whole transformation of reality takes on another level of importance. And it's also another level in that he is actually... He's actually changing what is factually happening to his son, right? However, what I would like to s remind you of a scene earlier in the movie when Joshua's grandmother first comes into the bookstore and Joshua is there alone. The point of this is very significant. Okay, and I want I wanted to point this out because I I think it's easy for people to miss this. She comes into the bookstore. She tells him that oh, your grandmother, you'll meet your grandmother tomorrow and she'll give you a present, right? Now, then just as she's turning to leave, he says, "You forgot your change, grandma." Right? She playfully teases him about his grandmother and kind of hides the truth, hides the facts from him. But he, he's figured it out. He's figured out that that's his grandma. It shows that Joshua is no fool. And I think that Benini put this scene in to let the audience know that Joshua can tell when someone is trying to hide the truth. Joshua is astute, yet he plays along. He played along with his grandma's ruse, and he will play along with his father. 
Now you can you can say if you want that I'm reading too much into this, but <laughs> consider this question. Whenever someone says that, I ask them to consider what was the purpose of the scene? Okay, because no scene in this movie is is excessive and no no scene is accidental. There's a purpose. There's no wasted screen time. There's no wasted line of dialogue in this movie. It's all very purposeful. Trust me. I've watched this film several times. <laughs> and Benini is very clever. And this scene shows, it tells us, Joshua knows. Joshua has figured it out. He can see right through the trick, which is even more impressive that this little boy is in the concentration camp later on and he's just playing along with his father. Who's the greater genius? <laughs> They're both geniuses. They're both able to give each other that gift. But in the camp... Guido translates the rules of the camp, right? He's literally translating reality for Joshua, changing the meaning of the words. And he translates the rule of the camp, and the rules are you cannot cry, you cannot ask for your mother, and you cannot ask for a snack. And... It's so, it's so good because Guido helps his son to grow up with these three rules. This is another gift, okay? He doesn't just help his son survive the camp. He is giving his son the gift here of helping him to grow into a man with rules to live by. Because he doesn't get out, right? Guido doesn't survive, unfortunately. But he's given Joshua certain principles to live by. Don't cry needlessly. Don't ask for your mother. And don't ask for a snack, right? It's basically be strong. Be a man, right? Time to grow up and be a man. Now, there are long-term rewards in following these rules. You will get your own real tank. Now, <laughs> this is symbolic. <laughs> this is in some way saying that you will earn the right of manhood. A tank. <laughs> okay? I don't think I need to say too much more. So although Guido does not get to see his boy become a man, he has a big hand in it by fulfilling his role as a father. Joshua gets his tank by the end of the movie. And that tank is a vehicle, which throughout the film has been symbolic of where fate takes you. Right at the beginning, there was the car with the broken brakes, and then there was the bike, and then they were put into oh, then Guido didn't know how to drive in the rain, right? But that still led to a romantic relationship. Then they were put into the car on the way to the train to Auschwitz, then they were put into the train another vehicle, okay? And now finally, there's this vehicle of the tank. It's been a symbol of where fate can take you, and it's a powerful vehicle, symbolic of manhood. In this case, Joshua's reward is survival and his manhood. This was his father's gift. Now, Joshua is not yet controlling the tank, but 
in this way, Guido has transformed how Joshua looks at his own fate forever. What is the real gift here? It's inner peace, manhood, quite literally, because survival is also the gift. He also teaches his son not to give up. Sometimes you, you have to hide to survive, but you don't hide forever. So, he ta speaking of that, of hiding, remember, he takes another advantage to create Joshua's reality with the, the game Hide and Seek, right? And this is a game of playful deception, a game where the players know that there's really no danger, yet pretend that there is. Now, ironically, this is useful in convincing Joshua that a dangerous situation is just a fun game. So, this whole second half of the movie, where Guido is recontextualizing his son's reality through this invention of this game, you might say, well, this is lies. But what is truth? Really, what is, what is truth? If you already know that your reality is created by your, your interpretation and interpretations of facts, well, how, where do you draw the line between the real fact and the interpretation, the judgment? Is music true? Is poetry true? Is a bedtime story true? Right? We, we tell our kids bedtime stories in order to what? Not in order to pass on factual information. They are to to transform their reality, their perceptions of reality. Is a game true? Is a riddle true? Is a joke true? See, Guido is a master of all these things. And you know, I used to be an English teacher tr teaching children, okay? I, w I taught children for uh, six years. And my experience was, you know, I was teaching in China as a, an English teacher. And in order for the children to learn the language, we needed to, often with the younger ones especially, we needed to convince them that the class was all about playing games. Otherwise, half of those students would not pay attention, okay? <laughs> the, the class had to be a series of games. And so I convinced them that that's what the class was about. The class was about playing games. And I would let them play these games for about half the class, right? We'd go in and out of, of games and exercises. And I would tell them, time for a game. But really, those games were designed to teach them the language. They practiced the language. They absorbed the language. Just like Guido has designed this game to teach his son, Joshua. Yes, it keeps him safe, absolutely. But ultimately, the game is even greater than that. The game teaches Joshua. So it's not about just whether what Guido did was tell the truth or tell a lie. What Guido was doing was being a teacher. 
and he, in order to to teach properly, like any good teacher, he transformed the vision of reality for his student, his son, Joshua. Now, this is how I see the second half of the movie. Not in terms of whether there was a truth or a lie told, but in the lesson that was taught. And you can decide for yourself whether you want to see it that way or not. It's up to you. Always up to you. But I would argue an artist does not lie, but tells a deeper truth. A teacher doesn't lie, but teaches a lesson. And you can allow your life to be a spiritual experience. So, question. Pick an aspect of your life you would like to change. How could you actively transform this part of your life into something beautiful by choosing how to perceive it and becoming the artist of your life that is in your on your worksheet and the second question here is pick something in the world you would like to change how might you actively help to transform this by serving others and again, I'm afraid I'm going to have to split this into two parts <laughs> because that lasted longer than I thought. <laughs> so life as art is this episode and life as a game of riddles will have to be the next episode, which I will release tomorrow. Please if you enjoyed this podcast, do subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening and leave a positive review. It really does help the podcast to grow and to reach a lot of other people who could really benefit from this. And if you do leave a review, I might even read out your review on the show. Uh, if you're listening to it on YouTube, or even if you're not, <laughs> subscribe to the YouTube channel Gabriel Sean Wallace. Okay, check out the website, of course. If you're interested in getting coaching, I've got both identity coaching and creativity coaching, where you could maybe learn to, uh, to create art in your life as well, okay? I'm available to do that via Skype or Zoom or WeChat. You can find out more about that on my website. Have a great day wherever and whenever and whoever you are, my friend, and keep growing into you.